Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at the uh, DevOps Live Meetup. Uh, my name is Mike Rosado. I'm going to be your host. And today we have some good uh, presentation coming along about SLO. If you don't know what SLO is, you'll find out for sure. Um, we're also going to have, um, I just wanted to talk to you about our DevOps Days uh, DFW, the DevOps Days Dallas. It's uh, scheduled for August, but we're still not sure if we're going to be able to make it. Um, a lot of it is going to depend on sponsorships. You know, if we get enough sponsors, uh, people being able to travel or not. So, you know, just stay tuned to our devopsdays.org website and everything's posted there. Uh, we just had a very successful DevOps Days Texas virtual where we had organizers from Dallas, Austin, and Houston uh, participating, organizing that event. It was virtual. We had a lot of people participate. It was great. A lot of great speakers. So a lot of that information and videos are already posted online. Uh, but keep checking our devopsdays.org website because we're going to have a lot of more, a lot more uh, events happening uh, throughout the year. Uh, a lot of them are going to be virtual. We still don't know who's going to be the first one to go live, so in person. So, just keep an eye on that on that website, uh, and I hope everybody's still doing safe, staying safe, and keeping healthy. So, without further ado, let me go ahead and bring. Uh, let's see here, our presenter today. His name is Kit Merker, and he's from Noble Nine. And I'll let him go ahead and give him a, a little bit, a little bit about your bio that they don't already know. So, hey there, Mike. Go. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody out there. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Uh, yeah, Kim Rooker, I'm over at Noble Nine. We're basically an SLO platform company, but I'm not going to talk too much about what we do. I want to talk about uh, optimizing for reliability and cost. And um, I'm going to share a little bit about that. But actually, um, optimizing for reliability and cost sounds kind of boring. So, I'm going to talk about the cheat code to reliability, which I think is a little bit more fun. And uh, if you're trying to figure out how to make your software services run reliably, um, I'm hoping that I can give you some ideas for how to make that work a little bit faster. And I'm even gonna go through uh, a free resource that Google created for uh, measuring uh, risk and reliability to help you figure out what SLOs you can hit. But before we get into that, I'm gonna start off by asking a really tough question. Um, a question I think every business, every software service should ask themselves, which is how much unreliability can we get away with? Now, this question might seem um, kind of uh, uncomfortable to ask because too often we're really looking at our service and saying, well, let's make it as reliable as possible. Let's beat our SLA. Let's make it 100% uh, perfect. And the reality is that um, by asking that, we cut into our ability to, uh, to run the service efficiently. And really what we wanna do is find this balance point. And that's why I say optimizing that balance point between reliability and cost. And that's what SLO service level objectives are all about. We, we know, and I think you know, the pandemic and the, the COVID-19 situation has really made this very clear. We know that our lives are dependent on uh, digital services in a way that they've never have been before. And people will talk about you know, digital transformation, which is this supposedly long-term trend. Well. I think Satya Nadella from Microsoft said that we saw two years of digital transformation happen in two months uh, as people were grappling with how to, to close down their in-person stores. Um, and now as we're you know, hopefully seeing the great reopening, I think the expectation is not gonna go back. You know, we don't wanna go back to having um, bad streaming or uh, bad retail experiences online or mobile apps that don't work. We wanna continue to see this uh, increase. And what this is doing to teams behind the scenes, right, who are running these services at a variety of companies, is they're they're really stretching their budget and stretching their effort, and they're getting burnt out. You know, they're getting pager fatigue. Um, they're chasing after uh, alerts and issues that are uh, affecting their system, some of which are, are noisy and are actually false positives, and others that are uh, legitimate, but still require investigation and, and review. And so there's this sort of like old approach, if you will, where we're, we're kind of uh, brute forcing our way to reliability, and it's not working. And there's a lot of energy I know from everybody I talk to in the SRE community and the DevOps community. Um, there's a lot of people putting effort into re, you know, rethinking 
how they approach reliability. And one of the secret tools, if you will, it's not really a secret, but it's a cheat code, right? As, as I'm, I'm saying here, the cheat code is the service level objective approach. Um, another way to sort of visualize the impact of reliability is to think about it in terms of two dimensions. First is the, the negative perception. And think about it this way. If you had just a great experience with a piece of software, you're probably not gonna tell anybody about it. But if you have a bad experience, you wanna tweet it to the world, right? And this is because it's hardwired into our brains. Um, our memory uh, makes bad experiences much more vivid than happy memories. And so when somebody's coming to your website or to your service and it's not working for them, they're gonna remember that. And that's where your reputation comes from. Unfortunately, it's not a reputation built on the good times, it's a reputation built on the bad times. And if you've ever worked in engineering, um, you know that fixing something in development is significantly cheaper than fixing it after a customer's already seen it. And so this combination of effects is what really uh, adds up to the, the cost of unreliability. And so people use this, and this you know it's not rocket science, right? But it, people use this to justify putting a lot of energy and investment into reliability because we don't wanna have a bad reputation. We don't want our operations to be expensive. And so we push our teams to deliver as much reliability as possible. Unfortunately, uh, reliability just isn't that simple. And uh, there's a spectrum of reliability from, from low to high. And if you think about sort of the low end of the spectrum on the left, and this is, you know, I'll give you some terminology, some SLO terminology here, a service level indicator, or what I think of as a service KPI, is basically a metric um, that you use to measure a service. And it could be applied to availability or latency or other reliability um, measurements of your service. And uh, across an SLI, which could go from you know very low to very high, there's different important points to, to look at. So on the low end, below a certain threshold, um, perhaps an SLA, a service level agreement, um, you may run into financial penalties. You might have a contract that says, I will deliver the service at this level. And if not, um, you know, I'm going to uh, actually pay money for that, right? Um, the problem with SLAs is they really model that worst case scenario and they represent the point at which people want to start you know, suing each other. And uh, it leads to kind of bad behaviors where people will hide outages or kind of squint at their data to make it conform to the SLA. And the other problem is whether you have an SLA or not, there's some threshold at which customers are gonna leave. You know, If they're coming to your website to buy shoes, uh, they might go to somebody else's website to buy shoes, right? Uh, and that that point is uh, really based on the customer's expectation. If they get frustrated, they go to an alternative service um, that's out there. And there's so many different alternatives uh, today, it's, it's kind of hard to compete. And everybody kind of gets that, like low reliability is bad and that threshold, we need to understand it, okay? But if we kind of jump to the other end of the spectrum, as we're trying to approach 100% reliability, which is actually impossible, um, we run into a different set of challenges. You know, it becomes uh, increasingly difficult to meet uh, the goal of reliability. And we build what's called, what I, we like to refer to as a gold-plated infrastructure. Um, the gold-plated infrastructure is where you're overspending uh, far beyond the expectations of customers. I like to say that, you know, every nine you add to your uh, reliability goal is another zero on your cloud bill. And actually there's a survey of, of CTOs that says 30% of the money they spend on cloud is wasted. And if you look at the, the math of that, it's, it's billions of dollars uh, that's going to the cloud uh, uh, efforts for overhead for um, headroom and provisioning, uh, over provisioning that's not actually felt by customers, which is really really expensive. But worse than the cost is actually the the velocity. If you've ever worked in an environment with uh, four or five nines, um, you know that the amount of redundancy and checks and testing uh, it it really slows things down. And so if you want to rapidly innovate, um, you're going to have a much much harder time if you reach that very high reliability goal. Okay. So the SLO, the service level objective, is this point in the middle. And it's very precisely defined as the, the point at which customers go from being unhappy to happy. And by slightly overachieving the SLO, not trying to make it as reliable as possible, um, we can uh, actually move from being burnt out and uh, chasing the pager from issues that we're facing to actually being productive. And the reason is because the SLO, because it still represents a point of excellence where customers are happy, it allows us some wiggle room, some freedom uh, to take some risks, okay? And uh, if you think about this, you know, that if you're, I set an SLO at say like three nines, 99.9%, .9%, what I'm really doing is I'm saying I can safely ignore 0.1% of error and still meet my goal, okay? That unreliability is what we can get away with. And this is referred to in the SLO methodology as an error budget. An error budget represents the amount of error between the SLO and 100%. Another way to say it is you know, inverse of the SLO. So 100% minus the SLO, the remainder is the error budget. 
And I'll talk more about air budgets in a minute, but the thing you gotta know about air budgets is you can spend them and you spend them on making a change, making a change for customers, adding value for customers. You know, Every time you ship a feature, every time you make a configuration change, every time you patch a server or migrate a VM, you're adding risk. But that risk is done for a good reason. It's to make the system better um, for customers. And so the error budget is a way to measure and manage that unreliability in the system to maximize the value for customers. And this is the, the reason why this methodology is so powerful. Um, it also leads to an organizational shift, which is instead of fighting over should we ship features or should we work on technical debt, we can actually come together and say, how do we wisely spend our error budget to best serve customers in this situation? I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. So this is the, the spectrum of reliability and how SLOs help find this balance point. That's why it's the cheat code. Um, Another concept with this for tuning SLIs, and I, I mentioned this before, is they have to be bound to a customer interest. You know, the customer is really giving us, or the user is giving us permission uh, to allow some amount of error. And they, they don't even know that that's what's really going on. But the way we achieve that is through what's called the happiness test. And the idea is you take these service level indicators, and I think of them as service KPIs. It's a small set of signals about your service um, that you can focus on, so you don't have to look at all the data. And we ask the question, okay, if we have an outage or the SLI is telling us that it's low, um, are we actually seeing real customer complaints? Is the outage happening during off hours when there's very low volume on the site? Or is it happening when uh, there's a lot of people? Uh, are we seeing complaints, a reduction in revenue? Are people complaining about us on social media? All of these uh, signals in your environment can help you uh, quantify whether or not your SLI is correlated with uh, what's going on with users. We want to make sure that the SLI tells us um, that the user is actually impacted. And the reason for this, again, is so that we can figure out when we need to pay attention and take a, you know, kind of corrective action or when we can actually safely ignore it, allowing us to focus on other things. Um, this is a way of regulating the amount of energy we put into recovering from customer issues. You might find out that something you were taking very seriously as an outage, you know, thinking you were doing the right thing for the company, actually had no uh, true business impact and no customers really noticed. And so it kind of leads to the question, well, why did I wake up at three in the morning uh, addressing a page that had actually no impact and the user just rebooted their machine anyway? Let, let me interrupt Please. you real quick. Uh, did you answer that question already? Oh, sorry, I didn't see. No, no worries. What about SLI? Isn't it important? Yes, SLI is very important. So hopefully I hopefully I addressed that just now. I was just talking about the SLI there. Um, okay. Sorry, I didn't see the question. Coming. No, no worries. No All worries. right, thank you, yeah. So yeah, SLIs are incredibly important. And actually you can't have SLOs without SLIs. So that's why one of the first things we need to do is make sure that our SLIs actually do correlate to uh, metrics that matter to users. And by users, we could mean, you know, an end user on your, on your service, you know, maybe they're a retail customer trying to check out, maybe it's, you know, a stockbroker trying to place a trade, uh, maybe it's a, a customer trying to watch a streaming movie. Um, if we don't know what matters to those customers, you know, that, that really impacts us. But it could also be other services. If you have an API or a piece of infrastructure, you might have other services relying on you. And so understanding when your, um, when your service is making them, those, you know, sort of robots happy uh, is a big part of running infrastructure or, uh, or other kinds of uh, services that have service dependencies, okay? And as we move to more and more microservices and cloud services and software as a service, these service level indicators become incredibly important to kind of create that contract between the different teams, okay? So once we got our SLIs figured out and we know that they correlate to users, then the next step is to define SLOs. And I, I just kind of put this in here as a cheat sheet to understand two common uh, SLOs uh, that we like to look at, availability and latency. And there are you know, a variety of different SLOs we could look at. You know, We could think about the freshness of a cache. We could think about the throughput of a data processing pipeline. We could think about um, kind of the correctness of a storage system. All of those SLOs could be part of your system. But just for simplicity, I'm gonna focus on these two. And the, the first thing to notice is that the SLO is a proportion, okay? It's a proportion of good or valid events versus total events compared to some threshold. In this example, I have 99.99, but that could just as easily be, you know, 97.3 or 98.9 uh, .9 or 99.8. Uh, the number is really based on what that perfect, you know, happiness point is where you can safely ignore everything above that threshold. Okay, it's also important to know where you're measuring it because measurement can lead to biases. In this example, you know, we're saying we're measuring at the load balancer, but you might be measuring in the client or in some other endpoint. Um, it's important to clarify that when you're implementing the SLO. In the case of latency, one of the things that is considered a best practice is to think about the different uh, thresholds of time, right? Based on a user experience. So you can say, okay, if, you know, a certain speed or, or latency 
um, we're gonna consider that a happy experience. And if it gets worse and worse, it might get painful. And it's actually uh, recommended that you look at not just one latency metric, but try to set as low thresholds um, for different uh, different levels. Maybe you have a, a P50, um, uh, a P50 uh, SLO, uh, SLO or a, uh, 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 you know, P99. Uh, so Dimitri, yeah, so so you're correct that you can think of the SLI as the proportion and the SLO is the goal, that's right. So this is taking the proportion, uh, valid to total events, which you could consider that the SLI definition. Uh, and then the comparison to a particular number is the SLO. The, uh, we think of this as basically um, the, the threshold that's our goal and then the data in terms of its uh, compliance with that goal. So are we performing? In shorthand, most people kind of just talk about it as the SLO. Uh, I, less often do we see people kind of like trying to precisely define it because the SLO and the SLI are just so closely uh, together. But uh, thank you for the clarification. Good question. Uh, I'm going to keep moving. So that so now that, that we kind of understand what an SLO is, it's kind of taking the SLI compared to a specific threshold. Um, then it leads to error budgets. And as we mentioned before, the error budget is directly defined from the SLO. It's the remainder uh, that's left over in the SLO. The, the way that we think about error budgets, though, is they're based in a time window. Um, so we, we might have an error budget that, you know, we're, we're earning back some uh, error budget over time, and then we're depleting it as errors are occurring intermittently uh, in our system. And what error budgets let you do is handle these changes to the system, right? So if you're releasing features, um, you're making updates to configuration dependencies, uh, maybe you've got, you know, new demand, increased demand, or you've got different services that are kind of competing for uh, resources, other issues that are unexpected, um, network failures. You know, the joke is that global pandemics have been eating up our error budget for the last year, right? Uh, the, the error budget allows these teams to align their incentives. As I mentioned before, um, the goal should be not, you know, team one saying, hey, I want to just ship as fast as possible, and team two saying, hey, slow down, keep it stable, but instead together coming to some sort of agreement, right? Based on the customer expectation, the, the customer need, the user need, the service dependencies needs, and then our performance against the SLOs over time. And the simplest kind of, uh, you know, error budget policy, if you will, is look, if we deplete all of our error budget, we should probably focus on making reliability improvements. On the other hand, if we ended a, a period of time, maybe a month or a quarter with lots of error budget left over, that's a strong indicator we can probably take more risk and we can move faster. And so it, it becomes a sort of self-regulating system for how teams can uh, conceptualize and think about um, their, their feature releases and how they prioritize their time and energy. And at the end of the day, as an you know, engineering team, this is a really important decision we have to make. You need the product manager, the business stakeholders, the engineering uh, folks, and the operations and testing folks all on the same page about what we need to focus on and not to bring it from kind of gut or opinion, but really using a, a methodology of data um, to support those decisions. Um, and I, I'll come back to the first question I asked, which is how much unreliability can we get away with? And this is, it's really a business uh, question. I wanna be more precise in how we uh, think about this and back into it from the business, okay? So I wanna present a scenario here for you. Uh, imagine we have this, um, this uh, SLI, uh, that uh, is basically worth $10 million a year. And it's the hypothetical business. I'm not talking about average cost of downtime. I'm not talking about sort of a, a aggregate, aggregate of, uh, of lots of different things. I'm talking about one specific, you know, click on the website, if you will, that we know if it's up, it's earning money. And uh, uh, hey, it's Dimitri. So, so I'm gonna I'll come, come to Dimitri's question. I'll come back to what I was saying. So. Google came up with the error budget concept. I think the question, it just came off the screen, but I think it said, Google came up with uh, the error budget concept. Is it right for a startup with 10 engineers? It's a great question. You know, I've seen teams that are smaller that are using error budgets. I mean, honestly, Google is also, you know, a, a large group of, uh, of groups of 10 engineers, if you know what I mean. And error budgets to me become a simplified way of talking about reliability goals. And so wherever, um, wherever you are defining uh, reliability goals and you want to make better decisions, I think you can do it. One of the reasons why it, it doesn't necessarily be, you know, it's not seen as something that can scale down to teams is there's some complexity in the infrastructure you need to do that. Um, but if you're running a reasonably sized service and you're struggling to either keep that service up and running or you feel like you can't move fast enough, I think error budgets are a fantastic tool. So I think it, it, it kind of depends. And we have seen some small teams, um, you know, implementing error budgets as a decision making tool. OK, so let's let's come back to this example. So we've got. $10 million on the line here with this SLI. And what we've done is we've plotted it across um, different numbers of nines, okay? So that's the blue line. And what you'll notice is that, you know, the jump from one nine to two nines, you know, we're saving, you know, $900,000 just from that first uh, increase, right? But as we go uh, to more and more levels of reliability, 
we, that line flattens out and you can see that it, it's becoming diminishing return uh, in terms of the money that's uh, that's being lost. And we're getting closer and closer to that $10 million, although we're never quite getting there because we would need infinite reliability in order to earn it. Now, the red line, the way I got this is I actually sat down with my CTO, Alex Nauda, CTO of Noble Mine, And I just, without telling him why I was doing it, I just asked him like, what does it cost to build a 1.9 system or a 2.9 system? And we, we started talking through the different design considerations. And at each level of nines, we kind of uh, uh, plotted it onto a chart and, and looked at that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a rough number and there's like lots of caveats, like you would amortize this across multiple services, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is the shape is, is roughly right. You have this exponential curve as you had to have more, um, more reliability zones and more fault tolerance and more, um, more recovery methods and more testing, et cetera. It just keeps getting more and more expensive. And you'll notice there's this point where the two lines cross. And this is the point where basically what I refer to as the NASA point, because uh, you've, you've now taken all of your available resources and you've spent it to keep uh, to keep this uh, this uh, revenue from the SLI. You spent all your resources. So if you're sending somebody to the moon or to Mars, you can do that. You can get away with spending all of your resources. But if we're trying to run a business, um, we want to actually be less reliable than that. We want to spend less on the engineering goal. Now I've I've shown this to a lot of people, and I ask them to you know kind of to intuit uh, where they think the the right number of nines is for the search. Actually, Mike, if you want to participate with me, if you're there. Where, where does your intuition tell you that you're, I should have warned you ahead of time, Mike, I'm, I want you to participate. Where does your intuition tell you that you should set the nines based on this, this chart? Uh, let's see, the nines. Where would you, so we know we need to be less than the crossover, less than the NASA point. So somewhere in here, where would you guess? Would you think this is like one nine, two nines, two and a half nines, or three nines? How many nines do you think this service deserves? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, You're welcome to guess too, Mike, if you want. <laughs> I would say two nines. Two nines. And what's your what's your thinking there? Uh, just because at the low point where it's just starting off. You're seeing the biggest, probably the biggest bit gains here, right? That's the logic yeah. a lot of people use. They say, hey, look, this is where the gains really kind of fall off. I don't want to lose that 900 grand, but, you know, everything else is doesn't seem as, as material, right? But it's not really intuitive from this from this slide, right? It's not really intuitive to see a point where, you know, where it, it's it's very clear to you. Let me show you. Dimitri gives the Dimitri says two nines. I knew Dimitri was gonna chime in. Awesome. Dimitri says two <laughs> nines because it stops bringing money. Okay, let me show you this data in a different way and let's see if we can figure it out a little bit more uh, clearly, okay? So I, what I've done here is I've taken the same data. This is just the, the blue line is the same, but I've plotted it a bit differently. So. The, we've now, we're looking at this on a logarithmic scale. So we have, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million. And see this 10 million line? It got even flatter, actually, because we're log logarithmic scale. And now the yellow line, which is a new line, is the value at risk. So what we've done is we've taken our 10 million, our hypothetical 10 million, that is our maximum, and we just subtract the blue line uh, from it, and we the remainder is the yellow line. And the yellow line now is much clearer that there's this sort of exponential drop off in, in in value at risk. This is basically represents how much money is at risk if I can't run this service at the different level of nines. You with me so far, Mike? I'll keep going. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the red line back in. I'm going to bring the exact same uh, reliability cur cost curve that we had before. But now, because it's plotted on that logarithmic scale, that exponential curve shows up as a flat line, right? Exact same numbers, just plotted differently. And if we compare it to the value at risk, you'll notice the crossover point here is between one and two nines. And what's interesting to me, and I, by the way, you know, Dimitri did a nice job here because actually two nines would be a very reasonable goal, right? We're slightly overachieving that point where the the we're still um, we're still kind of uh, you know building something that is a reasonable cost and it's keeping the value at risk in play, and it's just kind of rounding up to the next nine. Uh, but really somewhere between one and two nines is the, that perfect break even point that we want to slightly overachieve, which is vastly different than the, uh, you know, the sort of NASA point that you might into it or, so, you know, trying to be closer to that NASA point in the, in the trade-off. Um, so this is one way of kind of taking the business and driving to an SLO that might be significantly lower than you thought. And what that translates into is a bigger error budget. Bigger error budget means more features. It means more sleep at night. Um, and that's why this is a really powerful way to look at this problem and an analysis you can do uh, with your business person rather than just asking them, you know, well, for them to tell you, like, let's make it as reliable as possible. Because that's what, you know, a lot of people that haven't, you know, kind of gone through this analysis that they might think. Okay. Um, 
so when we look at the SLO approach, what the outcome that we see is, you know, number one is we're completely focused on the user. We're completely uh, trying to make sure that the reliability is satisfying the user, but it's still reasonable. We're getting uh, a, a, a excellent service at a reasonable cost. That's our, our true, uh, uh, true north for this uh, type of thing. We can actually engineer to a specific service level. You know, engineering to as reliable as possible is very challenging. It's, you don't know when to stop the engineering effort. You don't know when you need a, a certain uh, system or method to build that system. Um, and so this service level gives us a clear uh, roadmap that we can align to. And I'm going to talk more about how to build an engineering roadmap around reliability expectations in just a second. Um, and you can also move toward proactive incident de defense. What this means is because I have an error budget, instead of alerting on every little error, what I can do is alert on my error budget balances. If I can alert when I'm looking, when it looks like I'm running out of error budget, instead of um, whenever an error happens, I can actually get ahead of uh, incidents. And this is a really powerful method to reduce false positive rates um, and to make sure that you're focused on alerting on customer impact, not just when you know CPUs and memory is running out. Um, so if you add in resiliency and retries and exponential back off and all these other techniques, um, you want to move your alerting system to true user impact because failure is normal. Um, you get to manage the cost versus reliability. And this comes, cost comes in a couple of different places. You know, one is the opportunity cost of working on features, and another is actually the cloud infrastructure. I talk to a lot of teams that over provision and put a lot of headroom into their cloud infrastructure because they're worried that they're going to get suddenly hit with a spike they aren't going to be able to handle. And they're not certain when they can give back some of that infrastructure uh, to save money on their cloud bill or even just to open up more uh, headroom for other services. This is an important part of building a reliable service is also knowing when you can kind of turn down the infrastructure um, to support a, a lull in demand. Um, and this biz tech feedback loop, I think, is a really underrated concept. But how do we create good conversations, good decisions, and good understanding of the, da the data between the two sides of the business? Uh, and more and more, as we have these digital uh, businesses and digital experiences, that feedback loop becomes even more important. We need to make smart business decisions. We need to be very cost efficient. But at the same time, we don't want to lose our customers. We don't want to lose them because our reputation is that our service isn't reliable. And so this is all the, the great stuff we've seen as companies are adopting SLOs. It's true. It started at Google and other kind of Internet scale companies. Um, but what's happening now is a lot of enterprises and a lot of uh, kind of you know, late stage startups, you know, call them unicorns or proto unicorns. They're really trying to figure out how to build this uh, SLO based approach. And this is something, um, you know, in our SRE meetups and our communities and SLO conf, uh, this is getting talked about all the time. So really exciting stuff with the SLO based approach and it is uh, applying to more and more businesses. Now, I want to uh, take this from the other side. We talked about sort of starting from the business. But I want to go the other way, and I want to show you uh, interactively a free resource from Google um, for, for determining uh, the, the level of, uh, of reliability you can actually achieve in your service today. And I'm going to show you how it works. I'm also going to give you a couple of tips that the Google folks don't have in their spreadsheet to make this even more useful. So let's see if you can see this. Can everybody see my – you can see this, right? Great. Okay. So to start off, as I mentioned, this is a free, uh, a free resource from Google. The link is here, and it was on my slide as well, and I don't know if Mike wants to – maybe share it out to people or I can share it out. How do I put, I don't know where I can put it, but is there a place yeah. I can copy it? Yeah, well, um, yeah, we could put it on, on, if you could put it on slide share, that'd probably be the best, it's, I mean, the link. We'll find, we'll, we'll get the link uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll put it, I'll put it in there. You can, you can figure out what to do. Yeah, so so planning for rare events is it's a good point. There, the, the planning for rant, for these rare events, uh, Dimitri, um, is another big part of this. And and actually, I'm going to show you a little bit uh, in this next step. I'm going to show you some of the thinking on that. But you're right; there are also events that are not necessarily slow burns. Um, and the error budget really helps you as your system gets more mature to handle kind of the intermittent and transient errors that affect us uh, all the time. But yeah, you're right; it is hard to plan for that those things, but it can be done. And we're going to do that actually right now. So um, if you go to this spreadsheet, the, the first thing you want to do, and there's instructions, it's really easy. I'm going to give you a couple tips. But basically, the first thing you want to do is make a copy. The, 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 um, the public spreadsheet is read only, and so that uh, you can't edit it. So we'll start by making a copy just for this. And I usually rename it. And then we'll see. Let Google Cloud do its thing. And I think I'm doing good on time. This is great. Uh, so and I, you know, a live demo of a spreadsheet. Here we go. So the, I'll just give you a quick tour of it, and you can see how it works. So this is the first sheet, just instructions. All right. The second sheet, 
Is am I zoomed in enough? Uh, let me zoom in just a little bit more. I'm just going to zoom in just a little bit more. Like maybe there. That looks good. Yes. Okay. All right. So the first tab is instructions, as I mentioned. It has a link to the sheets. You can find it again. Um, the second tab is the risk catalog, and they've helpfully included some uh, risks. Uh, and this is where we're going to spend our time in a second. We're going to we use this to help us quantify some risks. Um, the third tab, if I can see my screen, is called risk factors. Now, what this tab does is it adds some additional uh, load or, or overload to these uh, estimated times to detect and remove. Now, the first thing I do whenever I open this sheet, whenever I make a copy, is I delete these. And I, I'm sure Google wouldn't be happy to hear that, but it actually, for me, this, that, this tab is not very useful, so I just go and delete that. So that's tip number one. And then the last tab is the risk, the risk stack rank. Now, what this tab shows us is given the risks we quantified on that first tab, which tells us the bad minutes per year, it will help us benchmark our service against a certain number of nines. You can see three scenarios here, four nines, three nines, and two and a half nines. And then the green here tells us whether or not we can meet um, the risks uh, or meet that target availability for this SLO. So in this case, based on the risk of the service, you know we can hit two and a half nines. Um, there's some risk in hitting three nines, and we uh, we can't we can't even come close to hitting four nines. Okay, that's that's kind of where we start. Now, when I lead a team through this, uh, and I've done this with a number of teams, what we do is we go through here and we actually delete all of these risks, and we come up with our own risks. Now, since we're not talking about a real service, we're gonna just I'm just gonna use these. I want to point some things out. Um, the, there's four parts to quantifying each of these risks. So let's take, a, let's take a look at this first one. A configuration mishap reduces capacity, causing overload and drop requests. We estimate we can detect this in 30 minutes in our current infrastructure. Once we detect it, it takes us about two hours to recover from that situation. Um, we have a, an impact only on a fifth of our, uh, our users, and it happens about once a quarter, okay? And what that results in is four minutes, 4.06 bad uh, incidents per year, right? and only or 122 bad minutes per year. This, uh, this calculation basically tells us uh, how much the, the risk is. Now, to the point that uh, Dimitri was making earlier, you know, we might see something like you know, unnoticed growth in usage triggers and overload and the service collapse. This you'll notice, you know, we can notice it really fast. We can recover from it um, in two hours, but guess what? It affects everyone. And it happened to us about once a year. And we have even more rare events, right? The operator accidentally deletes a base, database. Mike, have you ever had that happen? Accidental, accidentally deleting a database? Only me? Okay. Well, <laughs> you accidentally delete the database and you have to restore, okay? In this case, we can notice it really fast. Mike, have you deleted a database by accident before? Uh, yes, I have. Not, okay. not, not fun at all. Not fun at all, right? You notice real quick, right? You can notice it within five minutes. Look at the time to recover. Oh my God, 500 minutes. It affects everyone, but it happens once in a blue moon, right? Every 1400 days or so. So when we look at this rare event that has massive impact, right? This is sort of your black swan outage, right? You can see we have about a, you know, a quarter of an incident per year. And uh, one for nine. How do we know the numbers? Yeah, it's game day exercises. One one technique I've used for this, and it really helps me, is to um, to you know, one, you can go look at real data. Two is to get it as close to the order of magnitude. You'll notice, you know, these dates over here, like estimated time to failure in days, they're not, you know, precise numbers. It's 90 for a quarter, 180 for uh, six months, 365 for a year. These numbers are kind of rounded to um, the order of magnitude. And what you'll find in this exercise, we're not trying to be precise in terms of, you know, precisely how many minutes we had it. We're trying to get the shape of the outage or shape of the risk, okay? How long, you know, the reason why we want that is for the next step. I'm going to share the next step in a second. So let's say that this this is my my second tip is once you've got your first set, delete all you know, come in here, to just delete this, add your risks in, and go through each one and say risk is you know database database dropped like we just had, and you're going to say okay that's you know five minutes to detect. Oh you know how long to recover? Oh my gosh, 600 minutes to recover, 100 percent impact, and uh, that happens about I don't know once a year, right? And you're just going to throw these numbers in and go through it. And I recommend you sit down with your team and you just think of all the stuff that's gone wrong and you come up with like rounded to the closest order of magnitude estimations. Okay, I'm going to go back to the, to the sample data just because I don't feel like filling in real ones. But you, you follow me. So, Mike, once you've done that, and Dimitri, since you're following along, once you've done that, what I do is I make a copy of this. I duplicate this, um, this sheet. And I call this the baseline, okay? This one now is no longer going to affect the risk stack rank on the last tab. But it's, it's just a copy. It's where we started. But if I come over here to this risk catalog, 
you know, I can add in one of my favorite uh, downtimes. You know what my favorite one is? Planned maintenance. You ever heard of this one? Has this ever happened to you, Mike? Yeah, well, I'll assume, I'll assume yes. I know I keep calling you into it. It's kind of, see if you're paying attention. All right, planned maintenance. Take zero time yeah. to We know it's coming, right? We always yeah. know when planned maintenance is coming. We're gonna take, I don't know, what, 120 minutes of downtime? It's gonna impact everybody. And it's probably gonna happen to what? How often do you do, do planned maintenance? Like once a month? Uh, once a month. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. That's a good planned maintenance. So let's go see what this did to our, uh, to our, oh my gosh, I can't see over my screen, to our risk stack <laughs> rank. Well, guess what? Our plan maintenance <laughs> now just completely blew our goal away. And I think, you know, personally, uh, you know, this is my own personal vendetta against plan maintenance is that, you know, it's kind of cheating in a way to say that plan maintenance doesn't count against your, your SLOs, your SLAs. But um, you look at how much, you know, how much bad minutes per year can be just eliminated if we could get rid of plan maintenance, right? So there, there you go. Yeah. Um, one other thing I'll point out is if you want to try for a lower goal, we can try and see how low we can go and make the number green. So maybe I'll put a 70 in here and guess what? It goes all green. Maybe we put an 80 in here. Oh, we're good at 80, 85, 89. I'm sure there's a scientific way to do it, but here we go. 90, 95, 99. There we go. So 90, somewhere between 95 and 99, 97. There you go. 95. That's the, uh, or sorry, 90, 98. I guess it's just 99 where it, where it goes to red. Okay, so we've got a red here risk here. We can't hit 99% now because of plan maintenance. Now, this is the next step is once you've done this, now I've got a before and after. So let's talk more about the after. And this is my next tip is I go here to, to column B and I uh, or column A and I insert one to the right. And this one to the right, I'm going to make it a good size here. And I'm going to put in a new title, which it, I call the mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. So we have these risks. Now we're going to define the mitigations. And I like to call this my reliability roadmap, okay? And what we're gonna do in the real world, and I'm doing it here for fun, let's let's take a, let's look at our, wait a second, I just realized I'm on the wrong tab. Hang on, hold on, hold on, that, control Z, control Z. Okay, I need to be on the, not the baseline, but on the new one. So here you go. So we're gonna insert one here to do what I just did. See, it's coming out of my error budget here, we can undo. Mitigation. Reliability roadmap. Okay, this is my this is my tip. I use this every single time I do go through here. And what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a mitigation, and we're not just going to come up with you know the perfect solution. What we're going to try to do is get the biggest bang for the buck. So let's start with our our biggest offender. What is our biggest offender right now? Well, it's plan maintenance. So what can we do to reduce plan maintenance? We could have I don't know automated deploy. Let's just say. Something like that. Okay, I'm waving my hands a little bit. And let's say we get down from 120 minutes every month. Let's say now we actually are only taking 45 minutes of downtime. Okay, we, we just sped that thing up. Now, if we go back over to our um, to our risk stack rank, actually, we just improved our goal quite a bit. We can now hit two nines. We can't get to three nines. We probably not quite at two and a half nines. Oh, we are 99.8 maybe. Oops, 99.8. Yeah, so we're somewhere in there, right? So we we can see our, um, our risk. I should know, also call out, you can choose to accept a risk too. You can say, oh, this risk is acceptable. I also don't use this very much, get rid of the whys. I just like to see where, where we kind of, um, where we fall. I don't really care about accepting risks here. So I've come back to the risk catalog now and we'll, we'll look for another one. And we're gonna try to figure out what will help us. So uh, operator is slow to debug and root cause uh, bug due to noisy alerting. So let's do once a year for, okay, let's try it. I'll do it, Dimitri. Let's move this to once a year. We only have planned maintenance once a year. Great point. We do that and we come back. And this is where it gets really fun is you can start to see, you know, where, how do we get to the next level, right? And you can see this in real time with your team. And we're going to do a couple others, right? So accidentally delete the database, uh, restore from backup is required. The big issue, or sorry, uh, yeah, this one, you know, the big issue is the time to recovery. So maybe we can have like some sort of hot standby you know, or uh, active. Actually, the one I like in this one, 100%, or actually what I like on this one is we shard customers to multiple into, let's even just say into two um, databases, right? We just split the, the customers into two databases. Well, now think about it. Logically, it's not 100% impact now. We just go to 50% impact. So that one, now if we go to the stack rank, we can see that the um, excellent delete database went down to 64, right? 
not because we actually, you know, fix the fact that our operator is an idiot, or excuse me, Mike, but our operator <laughs> made an accident, <laughs> but only because we sharded the data. So we, we contain the impact, right? And if we come back here again and say, this, through this iterative process, we say, oh, uh, the unnoticed growth and usage triggers overload. Well, I think the operative word here is it's uh, you know unnoticed and it's it's uh, it's overloaded. So here we could say, well, what if we add um, auto scaling and we add uh, capacity capacity overhead, right? And if we do this, then maybe this happens less frequently, or maybe our time to recover goes down, right? Maybe now instead of 120 minutes, we actually get this done in like 10 minutes, right? Um, and with by doing that, maybe we uh, you know, we can't change the frequency, right? Like the unnoticed growth might happen uh, without us, but by doing this, we might increase uh, decrease our time to recover. Again, we go back to the risk stack rank and we can see the change. We can see that we're, we're making progress here. We went from a yellow to, to a green and you can come up with maybe some other ones, right? So the configuration is app, add config testing, let's say, and I'm sure there's lots of ways we could do that. If we could do that, then maybe um, the frequency would go down where it's, uh, uh, the configuration comes through less frequently or a mistake is made less frequently, or actually the time to recover goes down. Um, you may even say, you know, if you have enough test coverage, maybe this even goes down further. And you could go look at your data and say, oh, now we're detecting it in a minute because we have automated testing. Um, and so the recovery time, you know, what doesn't really uh, affect us anymore either because we're just doing a rollback. Maybe that's the one as well. And the frequency doesn't really matter at this point. And I'm kind of making it up as I go, right? Because this is a totally hypothetical situation. But in your service, if you do this, I recommend you do it as specifically as possible. And you notice from these four factors, okay, these four questions about the risk, you try to find the one that has the biggest impact that you can control and implement a simple solution for. And what you'll find is your team can probably brainstorm through some things. And the reason I call this reliability roadmap is look, you've got a series of work that you can do that you know you can quantify will improve the service. And by comparing um, the, the uh, incidents per year and bad minutes between the two sheets, between the baseline and the updated, um, you know, we can call this one even roadmap, right? You can actually see how you can make a specific improvement um, in your service to meet a higher level of reliability. So um, hopefully that was uh, cool for you. I don't know if there's any questions on this. What do you think, Mike? Will you use it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Dimitri, I'm sure Dimitri has something to say. Will you use it? <laughs> I think he's typing away. Uh-oh, he's typing. Okay. Um, all right, so that was that's all I have for this. I, I use this. Yeah, it's a great point. So, so what you could do next, so he asked about seeing the cost. So what I would do next on that, and not necessarily in this sheet. I mean, you could do it. I mean, we could we could even make a little... If you want to, what would be kind of fun is to say, you know, add in a cost, you know, you could have dev cost or, or, um, and then maybe you could even add another column for, uh, you know, uh, kind of infra cost, right? And you could say, you could allocate some budget to it and you could really go crazy with this. This is kind of beyond the mean, the means of this free spreadsheet. But yeah, you could think about this in terms of like, maybe we start adding story points to each of these things. Or maybe we start looking at how much money we're spending on tooling or on cloud infrastructure. Yeah, so you could go crazy with this. But the, yeah. the basic exercise, right, that you want to do is really to understand the risk profile. And once you have the risk profile, then you can start to understand. And going back to that other exercise before, right? Hey, so what is this SLO worth? What is the, the risk uh, of downtime? When we're down during these certain times, what's the customer impact on all of us? Um, so, um, so that's the CRE risk spreadsheet. And we'll, hopefully you can copy this link down. Just memorize this. I put BNS, it, capital P, lowercase j7, you know, I put it memorized. I put it in the chat for them. Even better. All right. Yeah. It's in the chat. So um, anyway, that's all I have for my presentation. And just to just to, to briefly recap, right? SLOs, service level objectives are this, I think, a very powerful tool in building this connection between the reliability metrics, right? You have all this data telling you about reliability. Um, your business KPIs, understanding what's important to users, what's important in terms of cost, what's important in terms of revenue, what's important in terms of other services, how are you running this business? And the the other part of it is fitting it into your developer uh, tool chain. How do you fit these SLO tools into what you're al already building? And just a you know very brief plug for Noble9. I won't, I don't like to sell things, but this is what we do. So if you like SLOs, like I'd love to talk to you about it and uh, help you figure out how to do it at scale without having to do your own math. So there you go. Thank you very much, Mike. 
I got I got another question. Are there other metrics that that you can incorporate to this as well besides SMO? For 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 which for the well, yeah, like if if you know if there are other metrics like SLAs, uh, MTTRs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 SLA versus SLO is a really interesting, I think, um, topic. Kill, kill yeah. This. Yeah, so, so in terms of the SLO methodology, part of the, um, the thinking on this is it's really about trying to get these summary metrics of the service. And it's not to say you shouldn't have other metrics or that you shouldn't measure other things, but right. it gives you a consistent way where every service in your organization and every service you rely on can have a, a, a specific goal that's a fraction of one that makes them comparable and gives you a common language to understand um, what reliability goal you set and how well you're performing versus that goal. Those other metrics, like you're talking about, like QPS and other things, you could look at them as a, a you know, as uh, as long as you have a goal, you can probably find a way to turn it into an SLI and an SLO, um, and therefore into uh, you know an error budget. Um, but uh, SLAs are one of the more interesting concepts because when we think about an SLA, oftentimes what we're trying to define is the minimum. And I'll go back. I'll go back to my one of my earlier slides here. Um, when we think about the SLA, we're talking about this minimum level. It's not even necessarily a level to make anybody happy. Like I've almost never seen anybody happy with uh, an SLA. They're, they're maybe not, not angry, but they're not necessarily happy. Um, and this is because the organization needs to sandbag, frankly, in order to set a goal that they know they can achieve so that they don't get sued and that they don't um, run into sort of these financial penalties. And, uh, and so managing to the SLA is important. I will say there's an opportunity, I think, to talk about how SLOs um, which is defining this happy case, right, can almost replace SLAs. I almost think of it as an evolution of SLAs. Um, as we're moving to more and more uh, services that, you know, are kind of like becoming consumer grade expectation, if you know what I mean, um, mm -hmm. we want to try to drive and define what that service level objective should be for a happy customer. And if we can get to that threshold, it'd be great. But one, one technique I have seen is people will model they're third-party SLAs as SLOs. And we we actually, I think through uh, our CTO, Alex Nauda wrote a, wrote a blog post for the new stack about this topic using uh, SLO uh, approach to monitoring third-party services. And so you can kind of think about your SLAs as a subset of your SLOs and then define SLOs that are a little bit stricter so that you have this um, this buffer, right, between yeah. where you're, you're gonna have the SLA and then you shoot to slightly overachieve the SLO, right? You, it's not about, hitting the SLO exactly, it's about being a little, just a little bit better. Um, with an SLA, you never know how high you have to go, right? If you say, oh, make it better than the SLA, a lot of companies I've talked to or people I've talked to at companies where they have SLAs, um, they just simply don't know when to stop investing in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the effort above that, that goal. All right, Dimitri sent another message. There we go. Yeah, so SLI, SLO, focus on what matters to business. It's almost impossible to align all services on the same indicators. Front end and batch uh, services have different indicators. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. And with that question, okay, what I the way I look at this is your service needs unique SLIs and it needs unique SLOs. And those will actually change over time. They should change over time. And they should be tuned over time as you get increased demand, um, as your business evolves, et cetera. And you should not have the same SLI, SLO um, at the front end as the back end as the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but the fact that all of them could have SLOs and you can look at the SLO without, um, without having to know the underlying implementation, I think of the SLO as almost like a new abstraction, right? It's a new abstraction that you can use that uh, decouples you from the implementation. You don't need to worry about, you know, if it's cloud or it's on-prem or it's you know, a specific open source project, um, you worry about the service and you worry about if the service is meeting its expectations for itself and you can question those expectations. So, so it is actually a way to align those things. And you're right, batch services won't necessarily have availability or latency, but they might have throughput, they might have freshness, they might have a quality or correctness indicator. Um, all those indicators, uh, if you can define them as proportions, consistently measure them, um, and then you can uh, set a threshold, then you can create an SLI or an SLO from that. Sounds great. Sounds yeah. Great. Any other questions we have out there burning? I know we have quite a few people online, about seven people online. I have to give a shout out to Danny who helped me get all the, Danny uh, Ludke from my team who helped me get all these cool 8-bit graphics into the presentation. Awesome. 
Yeah. It's a fun idea, right? Yeah, definite, definite. I like the theme on the the uh, Super Mario Brother theme. <laughs> it's the cheat, the cheat code. Here, here, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here your your Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we have a few more questions out there. Anybody else burning to ask a question? Uh, we have people still joining. Well, for those that are still joining, if you did not catch the presentation, we it gets posted. Um, you'll see it scrolling down there. It gets posted on the youtube.com for slash users DevOps live. Um, I'll I'll figure a way uh, with Kit to uh, you know if he could put the presentation up on SlideShare and send me the link, then you know we'll get it posted on the meetup. So People can download the download it from the slideshare.net. Absolutely. Let's see. Any, right. any, any questions? Let's see if anybody shoots any more through there. Dimitri, I hope we get to be friends. We can hang out. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Anybody else? Anybody else? Actually, there was a comment Dimitri made earlier that I didn't actually address. So he said, service shouldn't be the most stable or reliable. It should just be a bit more stable and reliable than competitors. This is an excellent point. And, and as much as I um, hate to focus on competitors and I'd rather focus on customers, the way I would uh, maybe explain that without saying competitors is it needs to be a little bit better than customers' expectations. And oftentimes the expectations are set by the market, right? And the market, you know, is includes your competitors. So if a customer, you know, is experiencing your service and a competitor's service, and they can't really tell the difference between those two in terms of reliability, you're probably fine. But if your competitors or the kind of the term, the art of the day, right, pushes the envelope. And, and again, like we saw with, with the pandemic and kind of um, this like digital first uh, move that's happened over the last year or so, um, it's pushed up expectations and the frustration people have with unreliable services. And, you know, I found myself trying to watch, uh, you know, binge watch a TV show and I won't say which service was a little bit flaky. And I ended up actually, you know, you like this one, uh, Mike, I had, a, I was trying to watch a movie. I was watching uh, training day and halfway through, I got up, I went and got a water, came back to the TV and it wouldn't play except in Spanish. It oh. would not play except in Spanish. And I kept changing it back to English. I rebooted it. I did everything I could. It and I could cap captions in English sound below. It had to I could watch, yeah, I could watch it with the captions, but Denzel speaking Spanish was not uh not exactly what I was looking for. Denzel and Ethan Hawk, you know, going and you can turn it into a learning experience because you learn Spanish and while well, you're reading the English. There you that's go. right, that's right. Well, I I uh, I ended up flipping it off and turning something else on and and a couple weeks later I came back to finish the movie and I watched the second half and it it was in English again. So oh, they, nice. they fixed the bug. But anyway, you know, you, you, our tolerance and our frustration, it's to it's so easy to change, right? If we're just flipping out to another a different website or flipping out to a different video streaming service or chat service or financial institution. I mean, think about it. You try to upload your mobile check deposit and it doesn't yeah. work. You know, you're not going to put up with that forever. So yeah, I know. thanks for the have. smile, Dimitri. I think that smile was when you said that we could be friends. Oh, good. good, good. Yeah, I know, I've known Kit for quite a while, so I, I mean, he's friends with a lot of people. I mean, he, he doesn't turn anybody away. <laughs> I have lots of friends and only a couple enemies, so it's... There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see All if we right. can get any more questions out here. I guess... I'll, one, one other link I'll share with everybody is uh, check out... Uh, wait, I'll put it in the comments here. Check out... Oh, I can't put it in common. I'll, sing, I'll link it for you. You can put it in slowconf.com. Oh, maybe I need to put okay. HTTP in front of it. Hang on. For that. Get, get to it real quick here. Yeah, that works. Yep. So we're hosting a first ever completely community driven event. Oh, that's right. Yeah, SLOConf. It's going to be the first one ever, and we're, we're really hoping for the best here. The CFP is open now until Friday. Um, we've had a, a great number of submissions already. It's going to be an attend while you work event. All the speaking will be pre-recorded um, in short videos. We're going to have um, basically completely focused on SLOs, and it's optimized for U.S. and Europe because uh, that's where most of the people we talk to we're going to be involved. But really, since it's pre-recorded, you can visit from anywhere. Um, so morning time in the U.S., afternoon in Europe, we'll have these like sync ups. Maybe a few keynote surprises we are yet to announce. 
And uh, we're, we're really looking forward to a fantastic virtual event and uh, really looking for more speakers, more attendees. And, um, and we are looking for sponsors, but uh, don't worry about that. We just need a CFP and, and speakers at this, CFP speakers and attendees at this point. Yeah. Yeah, the beauty of doing this virtually is that you can get so much experience worldwide, you know, together in one one location, you know. Which oh, is yeah. you know, hard. It's it's kind of it, it's nice to have the in-person conferences, but having them virtual, you know, it it just brings all that much more knowledge from worldwide together in one place. I, I absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we just had our meetup, the SRE, Beyond Seattle SRE meetup earlier today, this afternoon, and we had attendees from Germany and from all over the United States and Australia and all in one one place. And it's, you know, it is the kind of, I would say, silver lining um, yes. of, of us all being at home is we do get to actually, in a strange way, connect with people that, you know, oh, well, I'll see you when I'm in town. You know, it's not really a thing anymore. And so people are willing to jump on the phone or jump on the Zoom and, have a conversation. It's fantastic. So check it out, sloconf.com. Um, if you follow, if you follow also Kit, he has it posted on his Twitter account. So you know you won't be able to miss it there. Let me share here. There's his Twitter account. Uh, let's see here. Did I see anybody else post anything? No, nope. nobody else posting. Yeah, so yeah, you could you you'll see it on his Twitter account. Um, you know, so that that's gonna look like it's gonna be a great conference. So okay, let's see. Do we have anybody more? We're gonna call it calling it calling it good. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's it. a lot of fun. Not a problem, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing all this knowledge because uh, a lot of people are really uh we're trying to figure out what SLOs are and how best they can use them. And, you know, it's it's great knowledge to share out there. Yeah, and I'm so. happy to chat with anybody who wants to chat about it more. So hit me up on Twitter and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks for, thanks again. Thank you. Have a good one. Hold on a second here.